everybody. Thanks for coming up. Um, I'm Mushoku Space. Um, I'm introducing Liz. Uh, Liz is a Baltimore artist who does a lot of photo and video work. She opened up Color Wheel in 2015. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, there um, you go. Uh, Space out of the Cotton Cat, uh, she does a really good job. She's done work for me, and uh, she's a professional, and she uh, really cares about the output of the works by artists. Uh, so she's going to give some really good tips on how to prepare those files for printing. Thank you, thank you, Buddy. Yeah, working with artists like Buddy, for example, um, is one of the reasons why I started Color Wheel, why I really like doing this. Um, I've been working in digital printing for about 10 years, so I'm a photographer by training. That's kind of where it started. Um, and I ran the digital print lab when I went to grad school, and when I graduated, was like, I want to keep, I just want to keep doing this. So I bought a large format inkjet printer, and I have um, different kinds of paper and surfaces to work on. Um, and so I like to have people come in and we talk about their project and try to like figure out how it's gonna be printed. So that one-on-one -on -one focus is what um, I really like about having a digital business. So today, um, yeah, I'll talk about preparing those files for printing. Um, it'll be kind of a brief introduction on some ways to get your digital images ready um, and hopefully will be helpful. So part one, we start with our image. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm, I'm projecting well enough? Okay. Now your image is going to come from, you know, there are many different places that people call their images from. The three that I'm going to be focusing on are those with digital sources. So a digital camera, a computer, or a digital scanner. And as artists, as producers of images, we strive to create reproductions. And we usually want those reproductions to be good. We want them to look nice and be sharp and to represent the image that we're making as best as possible. So this is a little brief anatomy of a digital image lesson. Uh, a pixel, pixel stands for picture element, and they are dots of color that make up an image. So we have one pixel, it equals one dot. And image resolution are all of those pixels put together. So a pixel is like the building block of your image, it's like the skeleton. And the image resolution is like the skin. It's like everything all put together and held together. So you can, um, call your image resolution pixels per inch or PPI or dots per inch DPI. And I say dots per inch, I yeah, say DPI because it's weird to say, to say PP. But um, it's basically the number of pixels that are in an inch of your image. And the higher the DPI, the higher amount of pixels you have, the greater quality you have. And you can see in this illustration here that as the pixels enlarge, the uh, letter becomes clearer. So those are just things to keep in mind. And so, I don't know if you've had the experience of zooming in really close on a digital image and you see it break down. You can start to see those pixels. And they kind of are they're arranged in sort of a grid format uh, on your screen. And when you get really close, it kind of becomes this beautiful object in itself. There's like texture and shape and you sort of get lost in it, um, but then when you zoom out, that's when your image is complete. So I'm going to start with the digital photography aspect of creating a digital image um, using a camera. So there are basically two different kinds of consumer grade cameras that we're familiar with. The DSLR, which is the a uh, Canon camera on the top, which stands for Digital Single Lens Reflex. So it's like a film camera, but it's digital. A lot of them also shoot video. And then, or your basic point and shoot camera um, that people are familiar with, just like fits in your pocket, you know, little, little easy, easy to, to carry around. So if you're starting with digital photography, starting to make your image digitally that way, if you have a camera that has the ability of shooting in the raw, then shoot in the raw. Now, raw is like your negative. It's like your the absolute original, untouched, unprocessed. If you don't have that capability, like with most point shoots, for example, only shoot in JPEG, 
then change the settings on your camera so that it's the highest JPEG possible. The largest size, super fine, you know, whatever it's going to be. Um, just make it so that it's the greatest amount possible. And I'm definitely not down on the JPEG at all, but if you have the raw capability, I highly recommend it. So what is raw? If you think about it, it's raw like raw meat. It's fresh, untouched, uncooked, unchanged. It's your unprocessed data. And your JPEG, JPEG stands for, raw doesn't stand for anything, it's not an acronym, um, although you often see it capitalized like it, like it is. JPEG stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. And the way I think about JPEG is a bunch of old dudes sitting around a table deciding how best to compress your file. Um, because what a JPEG does is it takes information out of your digital file to compress it, to make it smaller, to make it easier to email, to send, to transfer, to not take up that much space. So you have your unprocessed data. I've been watching a lot of Star Trek lately, um, which is your original, it's your large file, and then your JPEG is compressed. So that's smaller, it's taking things out, taking things away. Now working in a raw file, you do need to have a certain kind of software to process it, but um, Photoshop has it already built in. There's also Adobe Photoshop Lightroom is another software that you can use. Um, so you do need something as a middleman to read your file, because it's basically just a bunch of digital information, and so it needs that middle source to translate it into an image. And then, but a JPEG can be opened up by basically any image reading program. One quick thing about shooting in JPEG format um, is if you do shoot in JPEG, then before you start working on it, save it as a higher resolution file. Save it as a TIFF file, T-I-F-F, -F, or a .psd, which stands for Photoshop document. Uh, because a JPEG, every time it's opened, every time it's edited, saved, closed, opened again, rechanged, that recompresses it every single time. So you're losing quality every time it's saved. But if you go from right from the get-go, save it as a TIFF, save it as a PSD, it's gonna make it a larger file, take up more space, but it's going to maintain that original quality. And that's what we want. So going on to the world of scanning and using a computer to start out with your digital creations, um, you might be scanning a negative, you might be scanning um, two-dimensional objects to then print out to make a collage out of. You might be making a 3D rendering on your computer that you then want to print, um, either two-dimensionally or three-dimensionally even. Um, the types of printing that I'm going to talk about, that I'm talking about today, are two-dimensional printing, inkjet or laser printing. But there are, you know, there's other kinds of, of printing as well. So sa the same um, aspect is going to hold true here, where when you're scanning, you set the DPI, the dots per inch, at the highest resolution possible for your scanner. Because um, you never know when that large billboard print is going to be in your future. You know, you, you want to capture all of the possible um, information so that you can make that high quality print. And the same thing with making something on a computer. To you have the control, you have the ability to start out from the beginning and set out and say, this is what the DPI is going to be, this is what the um, image is going to be sized at. So when you start out, start out, start, start large, basically. Um, it does take up more file space, but it's certainly worth it. The last thing I want to talk about in um, this section is bit depth. This is another option that you can set on um, your computer or on your scanner. Um, some cameras, I believe, offer the ability to set the bit depth, um, but I know that when you open up a raw file, that's another place that you change that bit depth. So a bit is a bit of color information that is there per pixel. So the higher the bit depth, the more color information there is. And here is, it can't quite see it on the screen, but the two-bit um, image is a lot less, is a lot lower quality than the eight or the 24-bit. So this doesn't really work. This image isn't really working right now to show you guys that, 
But if you think about just as the numbers increase, the quality increases. However, another thing you can't quite see is that the difference between 8 and 24 is hardly seen. It's, it's negligible. And that's another way of adding to the size of your file is working in a higher bit depth. Um, and so if you want to kind of cut corners a little bit, not cut corners like cheating, but if you want to um, have a file that's easier, a little bit easier to work with, larger file sizes take longer to open. You know, when you open up a file in Photoshop, it takes 10 minutes, and the little pinwheel of death is spinning, and the course are going to open. Um, but one way to avoid that is to stay within an 8 to 16 bit range. And that's what I recommend um, to people who come print with me, is working in that range. Yes? Uh, is this saying that there are, in the case of 24 bit, mm -hmm. that there are a possible 24 colors per pixel? Yes, exactly. Okay. So, and then as it increases to 32 bit, which is called HDR or high dynamic range, that's the, that's the as of right now, that's like the ultimate editing. I believe there's also 64 bit, but um, some of those higher bits have different purposes and aren't specific. You know, certainly for just digital printing and for other reasons why they why they're there. You're welcome. All right. So part two, as we create our image, we captured it digitally through a camera or scanning. Now we're going to process it. Now we're going to work with it. So I'm going to have uh, I'm going to go over just a few other settings in the processing range that are helpful for. Um, working with your files. So color mode is what is determines how color is read in the image. Even if you're working in black and white, you're st it's still called a color mode, um, and you're working in grayscale. So um, it's sort of like the, it looks over everything, and it says how everything's going to be read. So we have RGB, CMYK, and grayscale are the three color modes I'm going to talk about. RGB stands for red, green, and blue channels. It is an additive process, so when all of those colors come together, they create white. CMYK stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, the K actually stands for key, because when the CM and Y are keyed in together, they create black. Um, and then we have grayscale, which is your range of blacks to white to all of the grays in between. So the working space that I recommend working in is RGB or, CM or um, grayscale if it's, a, if it's a black and white image. CMYK is for more um, graphic, illustration, design, printing, commercial printing. There are commercial printers that require you to work in CMYK. And I'm not so familiar with that world, so I stay in the RGB world. Uh, CMYK is what the inkjet printer prints to. Yes. That would be my question. That's yeah. what I've heard. Because I've worked yes. in graphic design for years. And it's like, hey, but like, that's just how like the color profile is set up for each other. That's what the, so my printer, for example, has cyan, light cyan, magenta, like, you know, it has the CMYK. Yeah, case. it's the cartridges though. <laughs> but all of our monitors were generally, our monitors are RGB. So you want to work with RGB in your monitor so that the colors are consistent to what you saw in your life, what you captured. And then the printer's job is to translate that RGB information into CMYK. So the printer and the computer have a discussion and they talk to each other, and that RGB information is translated into CMYK. Does that make sense? Yeah, it I is kind of confusing. Yeah, it's just something I've always wondered about because for years, you know, I was working with offset printers, and you know, that's how they wanted the files delivered to them. Right. So it's not that I've heard of this about these large format inkjets. So. Yeah, so inkjets take an RG, RGB file, turn it into CMYK. Okay. Some CMYK printers require that CMYK file. So just know what your pr the printer that you're working with, what they require. But inkjet printing is all RGB. One of the reasons why RGB is a better space, or I don't want to say better, is a space to work in, um, is that it has a wider color gamut. And so a color gamut is a complete set or range of colors that are found within an image at a given time. So this circle, large circle here represents what our eye can see. The 
yellow triangle is the RGB color gamut. So it doesn't cover all of the colors that are there, but a lot of them. And the CMYK is even smaller, so it fits inside of that RGB. So the CMYK isn't reading as many colors. However, it does have certain um, qualities of saturation to it that are appealing to people, um, to certain kinds of work and, and design. So I'm also not, not down on CMYK at all. Um, this is just you know, the things that I'm familiar with in the, my workflow. So the color space is within that bubble of your color mode. Your color space is the use of the color mode. So it decodes the color. It interprets it in a certain way. So it takes that RGB and it makes it so that it is more true to real life or it might have more hyper real colors. The three most common color spaces are sRGB, Adobe RGB 1998, and ProPhoto RGB. sRGB is the smallest color space. Uh, I'm not sure if the S stands for this, but I think of it as small RGB or standard RGB. And this is the space that's used um, on the web. So if you're saving an image to upload to a website, you'll most likely save it in sRGB because then that will have the truest representation of the colors on the web. Adobe RGB 1998 is currently the universal standard for color management. Um, it was invented by Adobe Systems in 1998. And when they made it, they didn't really think it was going to become this, but it really is now the standard and is the working space that I recommend working in. Um, and then that I also print in as well. And then there's something called Pro Photo RGB, which is kind of recent. And this is uh, what's used in high bit editing, so that HDR editing, that 32 bit depth editing. And you might wonder, well, if it's pro photo, if it's, you know, it has more color, it has more detail, why don't we always use it? And one of the reasons being, so the horseshoe is what we see, sRGB is the small triangle, Adobe RGB has more. And Pro Photo RGB has all that much, you know, way more. So why don't we use it as much? And it's because if you can see some of the colors are going outside of our visible range of color. So it has a tendency to create what's been called science fiction colors, which might be really perfect for someone's process. Um, but if you're trying to achieve a natural, consistent color, then I think working in Adobe RGB is, is, is better because you have more control over the color. Yes, have okay. these just settings you Yes, these are settings. So I'm not sure if Photoshop is on this computer, um, but I could show you an example of how to do that. It's under um, Edit, Convert to Profile. Oh, wow. You also can set the color space in your scanner or on your camera in the menu settings. So I recommend becoming really friendly with your camera and um, get to know how to find those settings through the manual or whatever so that you can Number one, have that high output, that raw file or JPEG. And then number two, set your color space so that it's consistent. Most cameras and scanners are generically set to sRGB, which is that small standard color space. So you want to change it so that it's what you want to work with. All right, so the print. Part three, the final, final section. So how do you get your print to match what's on your screen? That's like that end all, be all, ultimate question. Um, you can't, basically. I'm sorry, you can't. Uh, the screen is a beautiful, glowing, lit object. Um, it inherently has contrast and saturation that a printer could never reproduce on a flat, two-dimensional surface, um, unless you then put that surface in front of a light. So you just sort of have to Going into digital, digital printing, just accept that what you see on the screen isn't going to be what comes out. That doesn't mean it's going to be worse. It's going to be better. And that's really what, what to think about. Um, the printer and the computer speak different languages, but they know enough about each other's language to communicate. So that's, you know, the, the computer has RGB, the printer has CMYK, and it's the print operator's job to get the two to mediate together to spread that knowledge. And that has to do with specific profiles and media settings that are set. That's a whole other talk. Um, but 
there's communication um, happening between your digital source and your printer. So the two ways to print that are v pretty common nowadays, um, inkjet, which is what Color Wheel uses, an inkjet printer. Inkjet creates an image by um, jetting droplets of ink onto a surface. Uh, the ink cartridges are connected to tubes that then spray ink in a consistent pattern onto the surface of your paper or whatever you're printing on. Inkjet is also really great because you can print on fabric and canvas and transparency and even some really thin sheets of aluminum or wood or glass. So it's a very adaptable process. And laser is what we're common with, you know, familiar with seeing in like an office or university or whatever. It transfers an image onto a paper with toner ink. It has less ink, uh, it's faster, it can, you know, make multiple copies, but it's not gonna give you that, that high quality. I found these really great diagrams online that show you the insides of the laser printer and the inkjet printer. So I think this is really, I never, you know, it's just this humming box, you don't think about what's inside, but it's got all this stuff. So the paper goes through all these gears, there's a laser that exposes it, and then it gets in the toner and then it comes out. You know, there's a lot going on in there. And then as a contrast is the inkjet printer, where you can see the ink is spraying out onto the paper. And so we have these different colors of ink, um, you know, usually CMYK, or if you have uh, a printer like mine, which is an Epson 9800, it has other colors like light black, light, light black, light yellow, light cyan. And when all of the combinations of those colors are keyed in together, they'll then give you, they'll give you those, those colors like, you know, puce or lime green or, you know, really bright magenta. Um, Okay, so that's the anatomy of the printers. And so your ideal printing resolution is 240 or 360 dots per inch, depending on the printer. So whether or not you're using your own printer at home or you're sending it out somewhere, uh, that's the range to work in. So from the very beginning, we started out with the highest resolution file possible, and we are working in our color space in that high res uh, file, and then when we're ready to print, we're going to save another version of that, sized at your print size and also sized at this resolution. Yes? So, is there a difference between uh, dots per inch and pixels per inch? No difference whatsoever. Okay. It's just the way that people have described. Because a dot is, is a pixel, it's the same, it's the same thing. Um, one thing I wanted to mention before I sum up is that, you know, a question is often posed, well, why don't we send that high res file to the printer? Because if it's so high quality, then, um, then it will come out even better. But, you know, and, and printers often print in high resolution. They print in 1440 DPI. So why are you sending a 300 DPI file to a 1440 DPI printer? Why is it the file 1440? And it's because the pixel on your screen, um, it, um, in the printer, there are many more dots. So there's one dot on your screen, and the printer translate, translates that to thousands more dots. Does that make sense? So that's sort of. That's what people are talking about when we talk about. Well, sometimes they do talk about the difference between DPI and DPI. The DPI on the inkjet, and is that maybe what that might be referring to? Like this 14, it's printing more dots. Printing more dots. Yeah. That might be, as far as I'm familiar with it, they're interchangeable terms. But maybe people have said, okay, PPI is for the computer, DPI is for the printer. I'm not yeah, exactly sure I about that. Say, I, grew up, I, <laughs> I grew up saying DPI. I mean, well, when I was working on it, it was like interchangeable. Right. I read some things so about that. So I, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I don't it, know. It's, it's really, I'm not sure exactly. Yes.
wonder, let me just see if there's Photoshop on here, because then I could show you the example. Yeah. So one of the reasons why you want to start out with that high resolution scan is because when you decrease to three, when you decrease the resolution to 300 DPI, it's going to increase the size of the inches of your image. So you don't want to upsize. You don't want to start with a 72 DPI file and just change the numbers in Photoshop to 300 because what that's doing is it's inventing pixels that don't exist. And maybe that's what you want to do. And maybe that's part of your process. But um, for what for we're, we're talking about, that's not. So, for example, do I have enough time to show this real quick? Okay. Opening. Oh, okay. So this is an image that is a medium format negative that I scanned. And if you go to the, here we got the pinwheel. Um, you have to place it? Yeah, I'm not familiar with CX6. Oh, now it's working. So your image size here, can you all see that? So I scanned it at 4,000 DPI at the size of the negative, which is about two and a half by two. Unchecking the resample image button makes it so that these pixels up here will stay the same, so it's not changing anything. And then you'll see when I change that resolution from 4,000 to 300, it automatically changes the size of my image to 35 and a half by 29. So that's as big as I can get. Scanning it in at 4,000 um, is as big as I can get with printing at a 300 DPI. So resampling to a larger size just creates, you might as well say, random. Pixels. Exactly, that's inter interpolation. And there are certain things that you can do if you absolutely can't make that scan again or the way that it started from or you want to have some of that interesting things that happen when you make up pixels. There are programs that, um, like, I think Resize is one of them. Um, it's a way to take a small file and make it bigger. So it, it has an algorithm of being able to add the pixels but adding them in a way that is consistent with the image. So um, to sum up, capture your image in the highest resolution possible, working in the RGB or grayscale color mode, and then working in the RGB 1998 color space. This is my recommendation. I highly, my other recommendation is that I is to do your own research and if you want to play around with Profoto RGB or you've heard of other things or if you've just you know like you someone has told you that one thing is another if you just do a Google search for anything it, millions of things come up and um, there's lots of resources out there of people having discussions over what profile they rather use like, at times that can be insanely overwhelming but it's also very helpful work in the 8 to 16 what no go ahead I would say TIFF. That's what I prefer to have. Although some actually ask you to give them JPEGs. And I would then maybe question um, what kind of print they're making. So working in the 8 to 16 depth bit range and saving a file to print at your resolution as a TIFF or a PSD, which is uncompressed, so it's the opposite of a JPEG. I recommend to work off an external hard drive, especially if you have these large files. Always back them up as well, either in the cloud or on another hard drive. Hard drive space is very inexpensive these days. And label your files clearly so that you have that high res original negative version, that's that high resolution, and then you save your variations off of that with your different sizes. And if you're not sure about it, research it, 
Um, there's lots of things to read, tutorials to watch online that can be incredibly helpful. And what I really want to come to is to do what's best for your process. You can take everything that I've said and just ignore it if it's not for you. Um, and really what is, what is best for the way that you work. And whatever anyone tells you, just do it the way that you feel most comfortable, the way that gives you the output that you, know, you want the most, that is the best for your vision. So here's my contact info. Um, my business is called Color Wheel Digital Printing. And um, if you'd like to email me, I can send you links to some of the resources that I have. Um, it can be a good start if you're not sure where to start, to start researching. Um, or we can set up a consultation. You can come by the studio. I have business cards and print samples with me of the different papers that I print on. And um, I have a table over at PMF with um, art prints for sale as well as cards. So you, offer, you actually offer printing services? I offer printing services, yes. I have a large format inkjet printer. And even if you send me a low-res JPEG file, I'll work with you. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? I'll also be at the table. I know that we're probably short on time. Um, it's, it's actually a process question. I'm sure everybody gets those. But oftentimes, working in the program that I work in, working on photos or graphic images, the uh, Right, like the color calibration is different. Yeah, I'm not sure. Is there, yeah, well, yeah. Maybe we can talk about this. Yeah, I was going to get into like RGB channels and all that. We can get specific. Okay, thank you so much.